good morning, and I'm just uh, very pleased to be here and would like to thank Technoport for inviting me to share my views on sustainability. I'm going to take you very far from the city of Freiburg and the world of Fold, but the theme is the same, sustainable landscapes, sustainable rural landscapes in developing countries. Why is this man grinning and he's very relaxed? He's at very high altitudes in the ne Nepal Himalayas. He has in front of him a pot of gold. The price of caterpillar fingers last week exceeded the price of gold in Singapore markets. What is Himalayan Viagra? The caterpillar fungus. About 20 years ago, this product was unknown in commercial markets. It was being collected, but it was not being collected commercially at the scale we witness today. During the last 20 years, due to explosive economic growth in China, where this fungus is mostly used, it has become one of the hottest commodities, natural commodities, in the international markets. Hundreds or even thousands of harvesters extract this product from high altitudes of the Himalayas to sustain their livelihoods. And the work done by our research group, led by my graduate students, Uttam Sharasta, has indicated that populations of this fungus are declining. So what is the point I'm trying to make? Biodiversity is largely unexplored. Biodiversity is very valuable. Biodiversity sustains the lives and the livelihoods of millions of people in rural parts of developing countries. Biodiversity is all around us. The human body is one of the greatest ecosystems ever designed by nature or natural selection. We harbor more than 500 species of bacteria in our bodies. We have 10 times more cells of bacteria than our own body cells. And these bacterial cells play a critical role in human bodily function. Indeed, Darwin was very intrigued by this biodiversity. We all know Darwin's fondness for beetles. There are so many that if you are an animal, the chances are one in six that you will be a beetle. So I congratulate all of you for beating those odds. So this biodiversity intrigues us, it excites us, it sustains us. But this biodiversity is declining. No matter what measure we use, number of populations, number of species, area under forest, biodiversity by all counts, by all means is declining. Since 1970, biodiversity has declined by 20, 25 percent. And most of this decline has occurred in tropical forests. Worldwide, 
since 1970, when I started working in tropical forests, we have lost huge areas of forest. Approximately six times the size of Norway, perhaps much more, tropical forest has been lost during the last 40 years. And the reasons for this loss are very complex. And there are multiple drivers for decline of tropical forests and associated biodiversity. Along with the decline of biodiversity, there is a decline of ecosystem services. And again, no matter what ecosystem service we may have in mind, food fiber production or carbon storage or recreation, the trends indicate all these services are declining because ecosystems are declining in their coverage and in their composition. And climate change is likely to exacerbate this problem. Poverty in many developing countries, I believe, play a critical role in both the loss as well as in the maintenance of biodiversity. Globally, if you look at the spatial distribution of biodiversity and poverty, we find that there is a very good correlation. This is a map of India where some of the poor, poorest district shown in the blue outline are overlaid on some of the densest forests that occur in India. And you see that there is a very, very good correlation. I take up the case of India because I'm most familiar with the situation in India. India has considerable amount of forest still left perhaps one to, one to two times the size of the entire country of Norway, depending on the estimates you believe. India also has very large number of poor people. Although India has done a remarkable job in lifting many people out of poverty, about 100 million during the last uh, 10 years, the middle class population in India now is almost half the size of European population, but there's still a lot of very, very poor people, 400 million people. And these 400 million people live in these areas which are heavily forested. I shouldn't say all 400 million people, certainly two to 300 million people. So India presents a challenge to those who are interested in conservation of biodiversity on the one hand and the betterment of human condition on the other. And I would contend the lessons we can learn from India are applicable to many other parts of the world. So most of my focus, or recent focus, uh, most of my recent work has focused on India, where we have been working largely with local communities that sustain their livelihoods from local biodiversity. These communities extract a range of products from natural ecosystems to support their livelihoods. This is a shot from the Eastern Himalayas, an area very rich in biodiversity. There are natural forests. 
If one were to go a little bit above that, there is a national park, and there are forests, and among the forests are small landholders. So among this tremendous biodiversity, you have acute poverty. These farms are very, very small. And the challenge for conservation biologists is how, to we, how do we maintain? And I should not say it's a challenge only for conservation biologists, but the challenge for society is how do we maintain these multifunctional landscapes, landscapes consisting of biodiversity and landscapes which also allow people to make a decent living, which allows people to come out of poverty and lead decent lives. I think in early 90s, I started to realize that conservation biologists, the approaches we were using, and the paradigms we were developing for conservation, they were too simplistic. And we will not be able to make much progress unless we brought a change in our thinking about conservation of biodiversity and the way we can move in the future to <clears throat> prevent the loss of species and ecosystem. And with some colleagues, I developed an idea to create a very different type of institution, a very different type of organization that will do a very different type of work. I set up Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. Our vision is to see a society living in harmony with nature, and our mission is to promote socially just environmental conservation and sustainable development. How does the word socially just come into picture? I neglected to mention that the response of international organizations and national governments to biodiversity crisis has been to create national parks and nature reserves. And these nature reserves and national parks, without any doubt, have protected biodiversity in many, many places. But in many, many places, these nat uh, national reserves, or nature reserves and national parks have caused a great deal of conflict between, between the state that manages these forests and the local people who depend on these forests for their livelihoods. Rights of people have been taken away and we face a situation where the future in many, many areas because of this conflict looks very grim. So our mission is to promote socially just environmental conservation and sustainable development. And we aspire to achieve this goal by generating interdisciplinary knowledge and paying special attention to policy and governance and building a new generation of envir environmental leaders. I started the organization 15 years ago with about $15,000, which, which I had at my disposal from a discretionary grant. Today, ATRI has become a fairly large organization. 15 years later, it is regarded now as India's premier conservation research organization. We were recently ranked number one in Asia by a study done by a group from the University of Pennsylvania. Our core staff consists of 
20 fellows who we call them as, uh, call as faculty as well. And I will mention in a few minutes as to why. But we are particularly proud of our, of our six community conservation centers. They are set up in rural areas to bring together academics, practitioners, policymakers, farmers, and forests to build sustainable landscapes. We are unusual in many respects. First, we have created two virtual centers, a center for biodiversity and conservation, and a center for environment and development. Second, we are organized under programs, programs that reflect challenges and issues we face. So under one program, we have global change and ecosystems. Another program under the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation is ecosystem services and human well-being, forests and governance and land, water, and livelihoods. And the third way we are unusual is we have interdisciplinary teams working on these issues. Fourthly, both climate change and governance, which are sort of dominant themes in sustainability, no matter what area you deal with, cut across all the programs. And finally, our academic programs are anchored in our <clears throat> Academy for Conservation Science and Sustainability Studies, where we have a PhD program. We have a PhD program uh, that currently en en enrolls 35 students. I just wanted to give you uh, one example of uh, our work with the small farmers. And we know the issues concerning small farmers. I won't go, go and deal with it. But the type of interventions we have tried to make to promote conservation as well as to reduce poverty have been along three dimensions, social, economic, and ecological. Our economic interventions have consisted of uh, enhancing income by starting green microenterprises in partnership with small farmers, establishing federations, corporations, of small farmers so that they can get better access to markets. Social gains have focused on strengthening local institutions that can sustain these economic enter enterprises. And our ecological interventions have consisted of strengthening local leadership of uh, ecosystem resources. And again, a number of activities there. And these are some of the broader examples of our forest and governance program. Working recently uh, with the government of India on a wide variety of contemporary challenges. And this is our framework for future. We want to build sustainable landscapes that address major components of environmental change with a focus on rural livelihoods social institutions, and conservation of ecosystem services, knowledge that cuts across disciplines, knowledge systems, and geographical scales, and more importantly, institutions, both formal and informal, that generate usable knowledge and knowledge for linking action, research, and policies with governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.